Okay, hello. Uh, uh, we'll talk today about uh, the Norwegian architects, where a fan born in 1924 and died in 2009. Uh, this was the man, serious as most um, Norwegians and the Scandinavians are. Uh, a, a good architect, a sensitive architect, and uh, an architect who tried to run away from the tradition, the Nordic tradition, and as he said, he couldn't quite succeed. But that's maybe a good thing that he didn't succeed. I admire the Norwegian culture if I am to think only of uh, Henry Gibson and uh, Edward Munch. Anyway, uh, so some drawings as well, a fan. This is for the uh, Norway or the Northern countries uh, pavilion at the Venice Biennial in Venice. A lyrical way of, of drawing, if I may say. I thought a bit too, you know, that on a on a on a round uh, uh, Earth, uh, rotating around the Sun, the situation that is described in this drawing uh, is very possible. That we actually on the earth, but, you know, uh, upside down. A philosopher and a poet, it seems. Now, the, uh, from 1958, the Norwegian pavilion at the Brussels World's Fair in Belgium. Um, you know, kind of uh, international style, modern architecture. Now, the Nordic Pavilion at the Venice Biennial in Italy, we already saw a sketch from 1962, and the building still stands just as it is. And this year, uh, an artist, uh, architect from Norway, uh, <laughs> created a chaotic uh, environment within this very pavilion designed by Sverre Fenn. So it seems that very civilized countries like Norway um, do seem to have a nostalgia, if I can call it so, towards uh, what it ran away from, and that is chaos. If we consider what um, this pavilion uh, hosts this very day, uh, this very year, and at this very moment. It's a good building, and the, the drama between the tree and the building uh, is uh, quite telling. Both in the corner of the building and in the center of the pavilion, as you can see. The trunks of the trees are, you know, almost like three sculptures within the pavilion, penetrating the roof claiming a right to live and breathe. Zverefen, Venice, 1962. Men and culture, men and nature. Now, Villa Schreiner in Oslo, 1963. This is, uh, I, I say, I would say, remarkable in the Scandinavian culture that even uh, when there is opulence, uh, financially speaking, uh, the the display of it is uh, rather reticent. It's it's um, they are not ostentatious. Very rarely you see signs of, uh, um, you know. Uh, aggressive assertion of one's uh, uh, possessions. 
And it's not hypocrisy either. It's uh, you know a sense of measure which I admire in the Scandinavian culture. I mean, as you can see, this is a large house, but still the image is rather intimate and it doesn't uh, crush you with its, uh, you know, dimensions. Yes, it uses the grid, but it's not, uh, it's not uh, rationalistically imposing. Maybe in part because of the material used, that is wood. You wonder, though, about the appropriateness of having the, the kitchen and the bathrooms in the center of the house without, uh, I mean, there is, uh, there are the skylights, but, uh, you know, uh, there is no direct uh, ventilation except through, you know, uh, adjacent uh, walls and windows. Brick and wood, they never fail us. A very pleasant house. Another villa in Sweden, this time 1963-1964. Here we see a you know, kind of a rotation. Although it's subtle, this rotation, because of the, it's not even a rotation. It's, um, well, it is, as you can see uh, in, the, in this section uh, drawing, but uh, the plan doesn't uh, suggest uh, uh, this subtleness. It's because of the corners in glass, which uh, expand towards uh, the outside and uh, the other walls, the four sides, uh, seem to suggest a centripetal movement, while the, uh, the corners will have a centrifugal uh, situation. A very interesting house, actually, with this interplay between uh, closeness and openness, between uh, masonry walls and, uh, and glass.
is actually no rotation. I was wrong here. When I look at this, it's, it's the way it is drawn, but otherwise there is no uh, diagonal in this scheme. I like very much this corner uh, we see here, so where the corner is not just, you know, plain glass, but there is uh, some kind of an interplay between furniture, built-in furniture and glass, reminding one of uh, at least one house by uh, Louis Kahn. It's an interesting uh, attempt to uh, escape the demagogy of glass if I can call it so. Well, actually, it wasn't me who invented this uh, wording, but uh, Andrea Kahn, um, an architect in the United States, who edited a, uh, a book published by Princeton Architectural Press with um, articles by 10 women architects. Again, he places the services at the center or at the inside, having a connection with the outside only at the top. This is what I refer to when I when I uh, looked at uh, the outgoing uh, glass corner uh, with some wooden parts and then the masonry walls at the ascent. And here you see a view of this uh, outgoing uh, glass corner, which also has wooden parts which can be used as shelves and are used as shelves. Zverev and fragmented windows. Yes, here, here it is. We could also maybe say fragmented transparency. Another house, 1967 in Oslo. Here we have the rotation at the center. The Scandinavians do not play games with wood. They know wood, they feel wood, they understand wood, and they respect it and even love it. And then and, and most works done by Scandinavians in wood are very sensitively and exquisitely even done. But in simple terms, not, uh, uh, not in extravagant terms as, uh, at all. As I said, brick and, 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 and wood, 
they never fail us if we respect them, if we love them, if we employ them properly. Now, Hedmark Museum in Hamar, Norway, 1967-1979. Uh, fine work, adapting his own uh, architecture to existing conditions. Not that he is not capable of uh, asserting even uh, concrete in uh, courageous ways. He is. Uh, he is not afraid of innovation. So an existing building to which he made his, um, uh, you know, interventions. The blending of rurality with urbanity or rurality with uh, urban civilization in the case of Scandinavian countries is uh, often uh, exemplary. So here we have the blending of the old and the new. A look at that beam. The snake beam. And the woodwork of the roof is always um, enticing in architecture, even when it's not very elaborate or done by a, you know, a, a very skillful architect. Um, and then we have this penetration of the building by the diagonal, the strong assertive diagonal of, of concrete and then uh, you know display uh, displayed elements within the building the old and the new together He's not afraid of the ruins either.
Let's him it is possible. Contemplating the future of his own building or his own contributions to the building, because in the end, what goes up goes down. It's difficult not to become melancholy when you contemplate what he is contemplating. If indeed that's him. Jean Hubert talked about the injustice of time, meaning uh, the injustice of having the work of man in time succumb to the elements. But I wouldn't call it injustice. It's in the nature of life. And as Goethe said, you know, uh, death is just another way through which, through which nature rejuvenates itself. And life rejuvenates itself. So the falling of the buildings maybe is not an injustice at all. It's just a way of making room for new buildings. Now, I know architects want to last forever, but even the Egyptian pyramids do not last forever. They are showing signs of being tired here and there. And many great buildings collapsed. So we have to come to terms with this and not call it injustice. It's a little bit naive. I was a little bit surprised that Jean Nouvel said something like this. It's like saying the arrival, uh, the arrival of the fall after summer is an injustice because the leaves of the trees begin to fall. No, it's not an injustice. It's the cyclical nature of life and nature. But I understand it's not easy to accept death. We all want to last forever and ever and ever. It's just not possible. Anyway, a good work by uh, uh, Sverefen. Melancholia and action, assertion and uh, reticence. Villa Vasque in Bumble, 1990. This one has elements of, uh, you know, like here on the left, this tower, in my opinion, is it, that doesn't look very convincing. It's a little bit. Uh, I don't know, uh, naive architecturally speaking, but uh, an interesting house though, when you look at the plan, very long, you know, a linear house in a spectacular landscape, a rocky landscape. Yeah, it's this tower, which I found, uh, I find uh, not very creatively uh, done. We could have uh, found a different, uh, roofing uh, less uh, less predictable less 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 convenient otherwise there are some interesting things here as well yeah the tower the tower <laughs> The tower is not uh, is not very skillfully done, uh, in my opinion. But everything else is okay, so to speak. I know this is not the language of of the critic, and I'm not a critic. I'm not just a commentator. Sometimes more inspired than other times, or sometimes less inspired. Yeah, the, the, this this hat of the tower is uh, surprisingly inadequate. Not functionally, because it functions, but uh, 
something is wrong there. The pattern of thoughts, it's very firm. The book, the cover of a book, the pattern of thoughts. Now the Norwegian Glacier Museum in 1991-2002. I don't know what to think of this one. It's a little bit... Um, um, I don't know, in a way too modern and too explicitly so, and a little bit mundane, and then the, the entrance is um, <laughs> a little bit desperate to, to, to attract your attention. I mean, the attention of the visitor. It's like a vacuum cleaner which wants to suck you in and Anyway, maybe I'm too harsh. But the landscape, the landscape is magnificent. And it's true, how do you build when you have these, um, these um, impressive mountains nearby? It's not easy, but it's a beautiful challenge. A lot of glass now for a mountainous uh, landscape and environment. Glass, in my opinion, should be a little bit discouraged in the mountains. But if you have the money that Norway has, maybe the, the electrical wheel is not a problem. It's not just about money. Somehow it's inadequate to have such surfaces of glass in the mountains where there is snow and where winters still exist, even at the time of global warming. Oh, crossed the center in Alfdal, 1993, 1996. He seems to like uh, architectural crystallizations that are, uh, you know, based on a lengthy, uh, you know, uh, promenade, if I am to call it so. I wonder in what way he thought, he felt that Norwegian tradition is, uh, is, uh, is still present in his work. I'm not very knowledgeable about uh, Norway or the Norwegian uh, tradition. I know that Christian Norbert Schulz was an important uh, thinker about architecture coming from Norway. For a short while, I worked with his son in the same office, uh, Palo Portuguese in Rome. We didn't like each other. I'm talking about the son of Christian Norbert Schulz. Anyway, another long building by uh, Sverefen. Adi is uh, very skillful at uh, bringing together various materials and crafting details that are legitimate and even uh, aesthetically uh, pleasing, uh, convincing. 
stone, metal, wood, and glass. I can't read this, I'm sorry, 2000s, the year 2000s. Maybe another small museum or some kind of a cultural center. There is more serenity here, although the Norwegian spirit could know or, and can know something about angst as well. If we remember the writings of Knut Hamsun, another great uh, cultural figure from Norway, for whom uh, Stephen Hall built uh, an excellent uh, you know, uh, house or museum house for Knut Hamsun. And if we remember, so uh, Edvard Munch and uh, Henry Gibson, here we have three great creators coming from Norway. I like this uh, canopy in the foreground. Uh, unexpected, no, in considering the natural uh, environment, but uh, surprising and uh, enticing um, aesthetically and, and beautifully crafted. I wonder how it looks that glass with the snow, uh, snow above, and I think it would look great. Another house, 2007. Well, this is a, a house. It looks like uh, something else. A house within a house or a house within a building. I don't know why it is called. Maybe it's just a, you know, a generic name, house. Hildendal House in Oslo. It looks like a, you know, an office building or something with that little house within. Skylights. The National Museum of Art, Architecture and Design in Oslo, 2003 2008. A small museum, if, uh, you know, a little bit unexpectedly when you think that uh, it's about, uh, you know, a national museum of art, architecture and design, all three of them. And then you look at the building, uh, it's rather small, but again, uh, I mentioned the reticence of the Scandinavian spirit. A 
again a lot of glass, beautifully crafted, but still glass. In the canopy uh, previously seen, it was okay, I guess, because it was not uh, an enclosed space. So glass was just a surface on which snow accumulated. But here is about the enclosure, and and thus the you know the losses uh, of energy uh, caused by this material glass can be significant, unless of course there is that uh, sophisticated glass which uh, uh, protects against losses of energy, but somehow even uh, you know visually. Uh, Glass seems to be incongruent somehow with the cold climates. Maybe even frosted glass, even if it is already frosted by itself. But the demagogy of glass seduced many people from the south the east, the west, and the north, and continues to do so. I wonder how the world of architecture would be without so much glass, or without glass at all, or almost at all. Could we conceive something like this? I mean, what bothers me about glass is that in this case, it turns its back on the realities of the cold climate. And it's so sure of itself because there is the technological mechanism which uh, allows for uh, air conditioning, but uh, under more uh, sustainable uh, uh, you know, imperatives, uh, I would say so much glass uh, should be discouraged. I hope I'm not judged harshly because I'm rather harsh in my assessment, but uh, too much glass in a, in a cold climate, in my opinion, shows a little bit of insensitivity towards that climate. And now we see this uh, quotation from him, I have tried all my life to run away from the Nordic tradition, but I realized that it is difficult to run away from yourself. This is probably true. It is difficult to run away from yourself, but maybe it should be equally difficult to run away from the stringencies of what we call nature. Thank you. <laughs>